All right, at this stage, I'd like to bring Nicole Pretzel Hollihan to the stage from Invesco. Good afternoon, it's great to be here and really want to thank Dr. Hales for such great information about standards. And this ties into the next session as this is such an important topic. Our next panel is going to be talking about standards, certification, and accountability. And my name is Nicole Pretzel Hallahan, and I do work for Invesco, a firm that really takes this topic seriously. And over the last 15 years, we've been trying to provide sustainable solutions on the investment front, but also really moving this initiative forward in the industry as well. And so we're going to welcome a panel to the stage today that consists of four individuals that will be able to get a little bit deeper into this topic and really um, keep this interactive. We're going to have Nicolay Lundy, who is Chief of Marketing Relationships Value Reporting Foundation with SASB in the conversation. This is, he has a great opportunity of taking the 77 different um, industries that, that Dr. Hale spoke about and really implementing that with, with, with companies. Um, Christine Robinson, Senior Manager of Deloitte on sustainability and KPI services team. She's also gonna be here today talking more about the environmental and social impacts of the business and supply chain. And she has an extensive knowledge with the, the industry reporting frameworks as well. Um, Steve Libertore, lead portfolio manager at Nuveen, an expert in fixed income management and applies these practices daily as he manages money for investors. And then Dean Amhouse, President and CEO of the Water Council here in Milwaukee, which is first of its kind, putting Milwaukee on the map for top-notch water research and education. So we have a great panel today that's going to, to dive into this topic, led by none other than your favorite, uh, Chris, Chris Merker, who's put so much energy into this agenda today. And so Chris, really looking forward to the discussion. If our uh, panelists would like to come to the DS, we'll get started. All right. Well, we, we have our work cut out for us today uh, following that uh, wonderful keynote by Dr. Hales uh, with all the uh, exciting developments happening in the space. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, going to be an interesting panel to, to hear from you directly, practitioners that are, are leading the way on this. So, all right. Well, if we want to just briefly uh, introduce ourselves, maybe we can start with you, Nikolai, and then come uh, towards me. Uh, maybe just give a, a minute or two on yourself and, uh, and the organization you represent. Hi, everybody. Sorry I can't be there in person, but I'm Nikolai Lundy. I'm Chief of Market Relationships at the Value Reporting Foundation, uh, which uh, manages the SASB standards as well as the Integrated Reporting Framework. So work very closely with Jeff Hales, Dr. Hales, who you just heard. In my role, I'm engaging with the institutional investors using the primarily the SASB standards for enhancing their understanding of how ESG can impact performance and value, working with data and analytics firms and corporate reporting software, as well as companies thinking about how they can educate and inform uh, their staff. So uh, happy to be here. Mr. Amos, Dean Amos. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm with the Water Council, and we are, as was introduced, uh, located here in Milwaukee. We are a water technology cluster that's been in existence a little over 10 years. Uh, so our principal focus has been around the companies that are the solution providers uh, on quality, on quali quality and quantity for utilities and certainly companies as well. Over the last six years, though, we have uh, put a special emphasis around water stewardship. So it's a little bit outside of the true water technology uh, emphasis, but recognizing is that more and more businesses are starting to pay attention to how they're using water and how they're managing risk when it comes to water. And it just so happens we know the companies that can help them solve their problems as well. So it's a nice little connection of once they learn how much water they're using and they want to learn more, we just happen to know a, a metering company up the road that can help them with their uh, solutions. Christine. Sure. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Christine Robinson. I'm a partner in Deloitte Sustainability and ESG Services Practice. I've been uh, working in ESG disclosure for about nine years now. 
Prior to that, I was a financial statement auditor. And um, during my time in ESG disclosure, I actually spent a, an assignment working with Nikolai and the, and the folks at SASB uh, prior to the standards codification. Uh, at Deloitte, we've been, we've been doing ESG disclosure now for over 10 years. We were one of the first big four accounting firms to provide assurance on ESG disclosures, and that was about 12 years ago. Um, and yeah, just really looking forward to the discussion today, and thanks for having me. Steve. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Steve Libertor. I am the head of ESG and Impact uh, for Global Fixed Income at Nuveen. So what that translates into is that I'm the lead manager for all of our dedicated ESG and Impact strategies. So I currently manage 20. They aggregate up to a little over $17 billion in, in total assets. Uh, I am fairly active in the industry. I was on the initial executive committee of the Green Bond Principles, so I did help to write them. Um, I'm currently on the advisory council. I serve on two different uh, UN investor advisory committees, one for climate resilient infrastructure and another for the joint SDG fund on blue economy investing. And I'm also on uh, S&P's ESG Leadership Council. And uh, myself and my team were fortunate enough in 2020 to be awarded uh, Investor of the Year by Environmental Finance. Wonderful. So uh, you've heard from this panel uh, all fantastic experiences and backgrounds and coming at it, I think, from a little bit of a different angle, uh, each of you. So uh, it should be an interesting discussion. So let's, let's jump right in. Um, I'll start with our, our first question. Uh, each of you has a different perspective on the development of ESG standards. Please describe their current role and uh, your current role importance in your organization's particular experience in either creating or making use of the standards. And Nikolai, we, we just heard from uh, Dr. Hale, so I might uh, jump to the next panel and certainly feel free to uh, jump in. So maybe, uh, Dean, if you could talk a little bit about AWS, I think that would be an interesting place to start. Well, uh, for us, um, the whole notion of standards, uh, when it's specifically around water, uh, we've been working in this for the last six years with a group called the Alliance for Water Stewardship. It set up a site-based standard uh, around how companies can mitigate their water uh, risk. Uh, and that enabled us to start moving further and further um, in terms of helping companies. And we've worked with a lot of large companies as well as small, medium-sized across all of North America. What really came to sort of the reality was one of our board members, Todd Adams, uh, who's now uh, the switch, they were Rexnor, they're now Zern Water Solutions, came to us in early 2020 and he said, there's something about this ESG stuff that you th we think you should pay attention to. And of course, when I have a board member saying that, I pay attention to it. And um, as we started to get involved in, you know, look at this more and more closely, uh, we saw that there was indeed something that was significant. It was growing very, very, very quickly. A lot of companies weren't thinking about it necessarily. And as the comment was earlier, it gets down to those small and medium-sized companies as well. And how do they fit into that mix? Uh, because while the bigger companies may be the drivers, those small ones are oftentimes as suppliers need uh, to understand how to go about this. And so over the last two years, we've actually have moved to be able to help companies to move in this direction around their water stewardship practices. So in many ways, uh, you know, the ESG is setting the, the standards and the guidelines and the directions and so forth. We're literally on the ground working with the companies on how to go about doing this. Now, a lot of attention has been directed on carbon, most you know, notably, and everybody, I think, is increasingly starting to realize how they fit into the whole carbon mix. But as we've gone through our process of developing an acceleration program around water stewardship, everybody knows water is next. They just don't know where to begin and how to literally start to crawl before they run that marathon. And so what we've been working with are companies as well as investors, uh, ratings agencies, to be able to help those companies to move down this direction of even before trying to move to a, a site level, 
if they simply start moving in the direction of paying attention to water uh, and how it factors into their company, they can make a big, huge step. And I'll, I'll close with one comment, is we talked with one small company out of Baldwin, Wisconsin, a uh, plastic extrusion company for the medical industry. And when I talked with them in July, they had done some changes in their equipment and um, realized that they went from 900 gallons of water a day down to 19. And I go, did I hear you right, 19 gallons? He goes, it has been amazing what it's done for our company. We've saved so much on the water bill, especially we've saved so much on our energy bill. And he goes, now we want to do more and we want to get into solar. And this is an example of when you literally get down to the trenches and companies can see tangible impact, you have strong believers. And they wasn't even thinking about ESG, it's about being better stewards of water and energy. I've heard that story once before. I love that story. And those are the kinds of stories that I think we all get inspired by. And I would imagine over the 12 years that you've been uh, operating in your role uh, and that Deloitte's been out there, you've been seeing this kind of all the time. Maybe, maybe talk a little bit about how that's evolved for yeah, you. Yeah, it's, it's been an interesting trajectory over the course of, gosh, even I would say the last five years where we've kind of went from this place of... ESG disclosure as a, a nice marketing document to ESG disclosure as, as more of an accounting, you know, financial statement, if you will, of ESG performance because it's, it's now a way in which companies can communicate their value creation story. And that, I think, is highlights the important role that the audit insurance profession has played over uh, the course of the last few years and continues to is as we now have these standards that are widely adopted like like the SASB standards um, using those as a mechanism to help companies adhere to those much like companies adhere to US GAAP or IFRS for financial reporting purposes um, and helping companies look to the standards like they do accounting standards and, and be able then to, to measure so they can manage, so they can disclose this information to their stakeholders because this is all part of that enterprise value that Dr. Hales was, was talking about earlier where it's not, you know, we can't, we can't measure enterprise value and just looking at the financial statements. There's a whole lot more to the story than that. Um, and, and that's where I think the, the accounting profession plays a big role is in data quality. We are um, well ingrained in, um, I'll call it the SOX 404, uh, as much as the, that terminology might cause some of you accountants to cringe a little bit. Um, but just the data quality and the processes that go into measuring this in order to help, help better communicate progress, help use better data in decision making, um, and yeah, give give investors and, and the capital markets better data. That's a good segue. Since you're in the capital markets, uh, what what are your thoughts? I mean, <laughs> having written some of the the standards yourself, how has that evolved over the past fifteen years? Is that how long? You've yeah, been rough. I mean, probably yeah. even longer than that. I, I think that where we are is really an interesting inflection point. There are there are so many misperceptions associated with responsible investing, right? First off, you sacrifice performance to be a responsible investor. It's absolutely not true. And secondarily, what, what we've been almost ingrained with hearing about for, for years has been that if you want to be more responsible, that's going to cost you money. And where we're finally getting to is an example that, that you gave, right, where companies and issuers are starting to recognize that there are financial benefits to approaching a more approaching their operations from a more sustainable perspective. I, I think often when we talk about ESG, what people don't recognize or think about is all we're simply doing is trying to identify issuers that are better managed and operated. Because if you're doing things correctly, what you're simply doing is recognizing a wider array of risk to your own business model. So you're addressing those up front, so what you end up with is an issuer that has a more stable free cash flow profile, which regardless of what part of the capital markets you're in, you want that, right? Whether you're equity or yeah. debt, doesn't make a difference. But we're, we're finally getting to a place where people are starting to think about things in a way of how do we extract value from this for our shareholders, our stakeholders, our clients, 
our employees. And we're, we're in a place where, depending upon where you live in the country, a renewable energy source is your cheapest form of marginal power. Here in the Midwest, it's wind. In the Southwest, it's solar. So you, when you start getting people to think about things in a way that it affects the bottom line in a positive way, then you get people to start thinking differently, which is where you hope you can get to. And, and that's where I think we've been able to start transitioning people around transparency and disclosure because it's being able to be tied directly back to a free cash flow implication, which is what everyone is focused on. Nikolai, I'd love to get your thought on that because in your role with working with partnerships, you've been seeing this literally on the ground every day. I mean, how, how has that been going, uh, the uptake, the interest? What, what, uh, especially since the merger, it would be interesting probably to hear your point on, uh, your, your thought on that as well. Yeah, well, I think what um, everyone has been talking about is the growing sophistication in this space, the growing attention, the changing attitudes from this is marketing or this is concessionary to this is business focused. And so part of that evolution means that it's not just companies collecting data, investors looking at that information. There needs to be and there's becoming an entire ecosystem around the use and disclosure of ESG information. So beyond the companies, there needs to be good advisors that can give good advice. There needs to be folks like Christine and the assurance uh, profession that helps make sure that the information that's being published is trustworthy and reliable. You need data firms that help the investors actually access the information. Then of course that can also lead to ratings. You need technology to actually be able to support the small and medium enterprises that maybe can't do as much of this in-house, which has been talked about a little bit. And then with all of that ecosystem sprouting up, that's why you have such a continued and growing interest in the importance of standards because it allows for much more efficiency in terms of communication and coordination around an increasingly sophisticated multi-organization uh, engagement around ESG information. And that then kind of, I think, leads to a final piece of the ecosystem, which is policy and, and regulation, which is growing in terms of the, the policymakers expecting to make rules and regulations, whether it's in the US with um, the SEC talking about first climate rules and then human capital rules uh, in the near future. Uh, Europe uh, taking a step forward with, uh, well, many steps forward <laughs> across the ecosystem from both uh, financial service providers as well as companies in terms of disclosure. And then many other markets, including the IFRS Foundation, which really governs uh, financial reporting in 140 countries, uh, expected to form an international standards board and so sustainability standards board. And so the, the, the explosion of sophistication and the broadening ecosystem from all different types of organizations in this space has drawn regulatory interest to try and create a little bit more consistency and comparability and standardization. And how far will that go and how prescriptive will it be? Those are still questions that we're figuring out, but uh, nobody can deny that there's increasing regulatory uh, scrutiny here, which is just um, another signal that this space is getting more and more serious and, and more and more relevant to enterprise value. Yeah, no, great comments uh, from, from all four of you. Thank you. Um, let's talk, I, I want to uh, drill in for a little bit on something that uh, Dr. Hales brought up. He talked about the alphabet soup, and you're talking about convergence, uh, which is uh, clearly an important theme today. Um, where do you see the future direction on this? And you already kind of uh, started going down that path. Nikolai, I'd love to hear from the other members, too. Uh, and what should companies and investors be prepared for, especially as it pertains to these new standards? Uh, and, and potential regulation down the, down the way? Well, so I'll just, since I just waited on this a little bit um, and I tried to tease some themes, um, I'll provide a, a spotlight on a couple more in depth. I think that uh, what, is, what can be expected is that they're going to be increasingly moving from voluntary expectations around disclosure to more mandatory expectations around disclosure. There's going to be increasing uh, pressure 
to simplify the various guidance that companies can give. It's very complicated. Uh, as you mentioned, there's this concept of the alphabet soup. And so to simplify uh, a landscape for guidance on terms of what companies can be expected to disclose seems to be moving in the direction of a set of standards and guidance that is focused on enterprise value, as we've heard from Dr. Hales and others, that is really the focus of the Value Reporting Foundation, bringing together the integrated reporting framework and the SASB standards. Uh, TCFD is very focused on this. A project out of the World Economic Forum and the Big Four is also focused on this. CDSB, a project of CDP. There's several organizations that are very actively working together around trying to simplify information relevant to enterprise value. And then you have efforts to go beyond enterprise value, which is probably not going to be something that the regulators take up in the US or some other heavily market focused economies, Japan, Canada, maybe some others. But in Europe and maybe some other places, you're going to see regulators look at beyond enterprise value. What is the information needs of uh, broader society, broader stakeholders around how companies impact society and the environment, not just how companies are impacted uh, in terms of their enterprise value. And so you're going to see, I think, uh, hopefully, and, and there's look good signals for this, simplification, but continuing to be two different spheres of information, enterprise value, and what you might call impact materiality instead of financial materiality with enterprise value. You're going to see, hopefully, and there's good signs for this, a sort of baseline for reporting that tries to be standardized across the globe that is focused out of most likely the IFRS Foundation, and then individual companies adding a building block or additional incremental information on top of that baseline. And then uh, that's just going to, I think, transform the whole uh, uh, landscape for the ideas around what it means to understand the relevant information for how companies manage risk and opportunity. And so it's going to give new tools to investors. It's going to give new data sets to raters. It's going to open up um, even more advanced understanding of these issues in a way that kind of the fragmented landscape today has not been able to provide as much continuity. So I think that's the direction we can expect to go. And we are working at the Value Reporting Foundation very hard to support that simplification and alignment in moving towards a global baseline. Any, anybody else want to jump in on this topic? And thank you for that, Nikolai. It was a great sort of outline for where I think things are headed as well. Yeah, I go, I go back to um, Dr. Hales had the slide with the house and the roof was the integrated reporting framework. You had IFRS standards and, and SASB standards kind of sitting in the house. And then he, I think he called it the yard. Uh, and that's how we typically think about GRI is the everything else. And to Nikolai's, to Nikolai's point, I think what we're going to see is, you know, finally authority via regulation on what companies are going to be required to do, but that doesn't take away all of the other stakeholders, that, that broad audience of stakeholders that companies still have to respond to, the communities that they live and work in, their employees, non-governmental organizations, customers, suppliers, consumers. Um, so in a way, it kind of all, you know, that alphabet soup kind of sticks around, but to Nikolai's earlier point, there's just maybe two spheres to think about. It's enterprise value and, and how we report to the capital markets, and then the everything else reporting that can be supported by standards like GRI that, that fit a broader stakeholder audience. I, I think that I would definitely agree that we're going to see more standardized reporting and transparency and disclosure for certain. I think one of the things that that is a practitioner I get concerned about is, is the potential for things to be too prescriptive when they deviate away from the transparency and disclosure concept. I think specifically about the EU green bond standards as, as a prime example of that. You know, when you think about what's attempting to be done, and, and it certainly appears as though, you know, that there's, you know, good intentions behind it, and Mark Carney needed a job, 
um, <laughs> that it's a it, it, there, it runs a risk of really dampening market reaction. One of the things that, uh, and, and myself and my team conduct a lot of engagements with in individual companies as well as industry groups and peer groups, and one of the things that we consistently hear about why more isn't done specifically on issuing securities that have a direct environmental or social benefit is there's a lot of uncertainty around what's expected of them and that they run the risk of being considered a greenwasher. And so when you think of things that are too prescriptive, which I think is what the EU green bond standards, unfortunately, are running the risk of, what you could have is a dampening effect on, on innovation. I think of some of the more interesting deals that we've invested in, you know, the Seychelles blue bond, the first blue bond, would not qualify under the EU green bond standards. The inaugural forest bond would not qualify under the EU green bond standards. The Women's Livelihood Bond Series does not qualify under the EU Green Bond Standards. And, and I spoke with an, an issuer that we view as being extremely thoughtful and, and, and a true innovator in the space, KFW, which is a German agency. They actually are one of the few that actually utilizes a third party to calculate, measure, and report on the impact associated with their underlying investment portfolio. And they said, yeah, we looked at ours, roughly 20% of what we've invested in would fit the EU Green Bond Standards. So what you run the risk of is, is tempering the innovation in the market that's really gotten us to where we are now. And there just has to be a lot of thoughtfulness, I think, put around whenever you're trying to be too prescriptive because you could end up with two markets. No matter what administration we have in the U.S., we will never have a green bond standard. That just will never happen here. So if you're a large enough issuer to come to issue a green bond as an example, you simply could just come to the U.S. market issue here and then swap currency back to whatever your home currency is or whatever the currency of need is. So the, the real risk is making sure that you're providing additional incentive and requirement around disclosure but ensuring that and transparency, but also ensuring that you're not choking off innovation, which has really been critical to get us to even having a conversation like this today. You know, yeah, Dean, I was going to ask you just to comment, because so much of what you're focused on, especially through AWS, is at the ground level with corporations. And to me, you know, this kind of fits into what Steve was just saying. You know, if you've got a sort of top-down view versus a bottom-up, um, I, I think there's, there's something to that, especially given how industry-led the development of this certification was, especially by water, I, I'm sorry, by uh, food industry, you know, a chemical, others that, that have been involved. Yeah, I mean, to your question of how do companies prepare, uh, I would venture that even though ESG has had such a huge surge in the last two to three years, probably 99% of the companies haven't really thought about this at all. And so this is completely new territory for them. They don't even know. We just finished over the summer, we interviewed probably about 60 different companies. There were many who I would have thought would know about ESG, and it was like a blank look. Like, what are you talking about? I talked with a, a major chamber of commerce. That person I thought you know would be completely in, on board with all of this. No idea. So I think that you know as we go forward, there is also such a critical role of starting with the basics of communication to a broad audience out there. Um, very, very fundamental because, you know, as I commented earlier, we're talking about the investor world, that's basically public companies, but there is this whole um, group of those private companies. How do they fit in? Because they are, you know, contributors to the problem and contributors to the solution. Um, and I think it's being able to, from a simplistic standpoint, being able to convey to them what does this mean for my company and how I can actually have an impact for myself, you know, as a business owner and, you know, have a commitment to the environment and, and see tangible results. Um, but I think that, you know, there's a, a lot of confusion out there. You know, what is sustainability? What is stewardship? I mean, we're talking about this with our staff. Um, it gets pretty crazy out there. And for uh, uh, many business owners and even public companies, I don't know where they want, where do they begin, and especially when it comes to water, they just don't realize how do I get started with that. So we've got to start with some fundamental things because I think companies 
um, need that basic information to be prepared for when these regulations start to come. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, it's sage advice from, from uh, both you and Steve on that because, um, you know, the, the, these problems, let's, let's face it, are going to require a significant amount of innovation. And uh, if we, we may not know the solution. We may not uh, anticipate what that will be even in the next few years. And so clamping down too early could be a, a real, real risk. So thank you for that comment. Uh, let me give you one example, and I think being able to play tangible examples uh, the light bulb will go on. So we're working with a company right now uh, in the water technology world. Uh, it's a global company and they've got eight different operation or facilities across the world basically doing the same type of thing in different locations. One facility in India for some reason was using a huge amount of water and they had absolutely no idea why this one facility was using so much water until they got into a little bit of an investigation and realized that the supplier providing them water was actually stealing water from them. And so they were pulling up tanker trucks to steal the water to sell out on the black market. They had no idea it was happening until they started going through this process. And so, you know, the grand idea of ESG and sustainability and investing is laudable. But it's like, wow, we just saved a lot of money by finding out we had uh, you know, this company that was stealing our water. Wow. Incredible. Um, any, anybody else from you two? I don't want to cut the discussion short before we go to the next kind of topic here. OK. The director of uh, the UNEP financial program said earlier this year that an emphasis on financial materiality, especially as it relates to TCFD or the task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure has been inadequate, and that instead we should be focusing on double materiality, which I'll briefly define for the audience as considering factors that may directly impact the value of companies or financial materiality, but go beyond to consider the broader impacts to people and planet. Would love to get your perspective on this, you know, especially given that granular example of, hey, I'm just trying to stop the company from being stolen from. <laughs> Uh, what, what other things, what broader things uh, may be uh, relevant here to, to think about relative to double materiality? I think there's an effort to say that one or the other is better uh, or one or the other is right or wrong, which I think is a little misguided because it's usually for different types of decisions, different uh, users. So... Uh, double materiality is really a term that kind of came out of the EU uh, and a sustainable finance project task force uh, that has kind of been uh, taken up by folks like the UN Environmental Program Finance Initiative, the UN UNF5 folks that you mentioned, Chris, that um, is really to say that there is, of course, financial materiality or understanding enterprise value that's already built into the capital markets but that's inadequate for understanding. And that's really going to tell you how, you know, water usage is gonna impact a business. In Dean's case, it's how water usage in terms of just one measuring one plant's water usage is gonna get you to understand that it's an outlier compared to the other businesses, it helps you understand that it's impacting performance and it's because it's being diverted and stolen. But it's really about understanding how water usage might impact the business. Whereas the uh, focus, and, and Christine talked about this really well, the focus of kind of sustainability reporting and its very infancy with the global reporting initiative, the GRI, was to say that there are more stakeholders in the world than just users of uh, information for economic benefit, which is primarily short change to investors. But there's all sorts of people who might be trying to understand whether it's the company itself or others who are trying to understand how an company is performing mainly through an economic lens. Uh, there are other stakeholders in that. That's really kind of the emergence of sustainability reporting around 2000, is that there are customers and suppliers and uh, communities that, uh, where people live, where the companies operate, and all sorts of other stakeholders that might not be primarily concerned about the economic impact to the company, but how the company is impacting or how an organization, whether it's a governmental body or a nonprofit, any sort of organization, how they might be impacting 
society and, and the planet more broadly. And so usually they're just different types of decisions, trying to make economically minded decisions, either as the manager of a business or as a potential provider of capital to the business. You're just trying to understand things differently than somebody who lives or wants to maybe work for a company or is trying to understand how a company is impacting, you know, a city that you're managing as mayor or city council, whatever it is. Uh, those are just different decisions that can often benefit from different information. And so I think it's fair to say that financial materiality and focus on enterprise value is not going to alone drive a better understanding holistically around the world around what information can help us make better decisions, whether it's where we want to work, how we want to engage with the community, with the companies and the communities where we live, whatever it is. But to say that only expecting all users to always care about double materiality and to expect all investors or all you know, economically motivated decision makers to be considering all the totality of information is just going to be overwhelming and it's just going to lead to a lot of noise that can lead you to ignore some of the clear signals if you're able to focus on just financial materiality in some cases or you know, just ignore financial materiality in other cases and just ignore how an organization might impact society regardless of how the organization is performing economically. I think that the critical piece is to understand that there's different information for different users and double materiality tends to say that at least if you think about it from a regulatory perspective, the EU wants to make sure that companies report on both information. That's probably not going to happen in a lot of countries, but that doesn't mean that companies couldn't do that voluntarily like they do already. Um, and that that information that goes beyond financial materiality could still be useful for other purposes, but that doesn't then mean that financial materiality is inadequate for other purposes. So I think it's just a false dichotomy if, if folks think that it's just one or the other is better. There's just different uses of information for different types of decisions. Anyone else want to take a, a comment on that? Well, and I would say it, it's it's both too. It's it's two sides of almost this almost the same coin. Um, where a lot of times, you know, we, we talk about one side of materiality being, oh, you know, some big event has happened and, and, and it's caused an issue with, you know, a particular stakeholder group. Um, but, I, but I think what also gets overlooked is the, the tie directly to financial materiality. It's not an easy, oftentimes it's not an easy bridge to walk between, you know, how ESG performance really does impact the financial statements, um, but it does. And you can, you, you know, you can look at it through how how discount rates may change, weighted average cost, cost of capital, um, various different uh, financial metrics that are impacted by ESG more than more than one would think because we don't measure... ESG in dollars and cents, generally it's gallons of water or metric tons of emissions or you know number of people employed. Um, so it's a it's a it's a bit harder of a, a bridge to walk there. But I don't I think it, it kind of goes back to what we're seeing and happening in the standards landscape too, where you know the development of an international sustainability standards board, what's happening in Europe even at the SEC, kind of this, you know, trying to hone in a little bit more on that financial impact of ESG materiality while also keeping an eye out for the, the other side of materiality where there are still important ESG impacts. I think that they're actually not separate concepts. They're actually interrelated, which I think taken off of your points. I think of the easiest example that came to my head would be a hard to abate sector like oil and gas. You know, as an ESG investor, again, one of the main misperceptions is that you don't invest in oil and gas companies. That that is not true. What you want to do, though, is if you are invested in an oil and gas company, you want to invest in one that is a good steward of the environment, and that is because they exhibit more stable free cash flow over time because they don't have spills. So therefore, they're not paying remediation costs. They don't, and, and because of that, they're a good neighbor. They participate more in the societal well-being of the areas they're operating in, and therefore, they win more contracts over the longer run, so they have more business. So I think that 
again, it's, it's the, the mindset is changing to understand that both of those things are related and, and we're seeing it even expanded out where we have seen um, uh, a Georgia Power Company issued a sustainability bond where part of the proceeds went to providing funding for affordable housing within its service territory. Now, that is obviously a very laudable goal for them, and that is fantastic, but that also benefits their free cash flow over time. So, again, being a, and I think it goes back to the concept of being a focused on stakeholders relates back to your overall operations and how you can assess the way that your, your business or your operations are going to continue to evolve over time and that all of them are interrelated. You know, it's, you know, goes all the way back, you know, the, the Henry Ford concept. I have to make a car that everyone can afford or I have no business. So that's really, I think, how it's starting to play out now more with, with managements of companies recognizing that impact. Yeah. Well, and, and it's really it comes down to, um, you know, as we start talking about more and more on the finances and how it's financially beneficial for a company and investors are looking at it for finance, it actually is having a positive impact on climate change because mm -hmm. it is happening. I mean, you cannot deny it. It is happening in terms of trying to get more inclusive hiring, um, you know, women on boards, all of those things. Uh, so while the conversation probably started on the environment and climate change as we need to address this problem, let's also not forget it that that's the byproduct out of all of these things too. Yeah, no, it's excellent observations from, from all of you. I, I think, I say this to my own students, you know, how do we sort of resolve this debate of stockholder primacy versus stakeholder? And I think, you know, people are finding interests tend to align over time actually, when, when, and they're not mutually exclusive. So uh, I think well, well said. Um, I, I, Can I just chime in on one thing, which is that the conversation that's happening, like among members of the European Parliament, among the European Financial Reporting Organization, FRAG, that's trying to set sustainability standards, like a lot of the examples of where companies think about stakeholders like I think the Georgia Power is a great example around issuing a, a, a consideration, issuing a bond that's going to ultimately help fund uh, low-income housing, which then just creates more customers to purchase their power. All of that would be seen primarily through the lens of financial materiality, because it's how can this impact the bottom line of the company, and the the discussion and the debate among the fiercest defenders of double materiality, really the fo the second piece of double materiality, which is focused on impact, is that we shouldn't talk about information. There should be some information that has no connection to the company's financial performance. And that when it comes to thinking about how the company's making decisions through the lens of how it's gonna impact their bottom line, that ties back to financial materiality. And there's other information that is not relevant to financial performance that we need to expect companies to report on and make decisions about. So I just wanna make it really clear that at least among some users of the term of double materiality it is a very strict philosophical view that the capital markets are too short-term oriented and that the focus on financial returns is a key reason that capital markets are not going to be the primary solution to these problems. I don't necessarily think that I think it's it's I think that there are multiple pieces to solutions, but I just want to make it clear what some of the users of the term double materiality are really trying to say. And that may be part of the problem with it, because you're not going to expect corporations, for example, to focus on things that may be considered outside of their control, or you're more likely to incentivize them to do more if you're able to tie it to the financial incentives that could be beneficial for them over time. Right, which is why it's largely considered a policy discussion around what policymakers want to implement outside of the decision-making of capital markets where you're going to find a natural inclination to, to make those considerations. So, so we don't need to have a whole debate on this. I just really want to make it clear that there is significant interest among some folks in the sustainability community around really pushing that through the policy lens outside of the considerations of financial performance. Yeah, no, th thank you for uh, making that point. 
Um, it, it sort of brings us to the next question, which I, I think is very relevant to the discussion we're having right now. While an overwhelming number of countries have signed on to the Paris Accord, including the US belatedly, many have been criticized for their implementation or appear already well behind stated targets. What is your thought on market-led versus regulatory, especially as it relates to standards? And specifically, are you finding many companies are taking a wait and see approach, or are they leading the way? And can we say which course may be more preferred than the other at this point? I know there's a lot in that question, so take whichever part you like. <laughs> I'll start. I think it's a combination of both. You know, you're going to need both policy as well as capital market discipline to, to arrive at these issues. I do think that there is more of a wait and see approach because there is currently no clear advantage to doing something first. Right, and, and a lot of the solutions I think that people are looking at from, from say a COP26 perspective is somewhat technology related. And then it becomes financial related relative to that technology. So the longer you wait, the better off you may be or it may be least impactful to your country and your citizenry to wait to see what the best approach might be. So a lot of the discussions that I always hear from, from um, you know, potential issuers, especially at the sovereign level, is a lot of them are waiting on the development of battery storage technology at a utility scale level because they feel as though they can easily, in a lot of developing countries, have tremendous resource, whether it's solar or wind, again, depending upon where you are, but the problem is baseload generation. So they feel as though the development of Battery technology provides them that coverage and the ability for them to make a more straight shift instead of taking a stair-step approach. So I think it's obviously going to require policy approach, and, it, and, and a lot of it is going to be policy support. You know, we've gotten to where we are in the U.S., for example, with, with renewables because there has been bipartisan strong support for renewable energy. So if you have that in place, then you can... I think establish more capital market approaches that work within that policy framework to get to a solution that is beneficial for everyone. But I think that you're going to continue to see it's, it's, e, it's similar to what I would consider to be the net zero commitments. I can commit to you to playing shortstop for the Yankees next season. Brian Cashman doesn't care, right? So I make a commitment today in 30 years from now you realize all of the people that are sitting there in that press release will no longer be associated with whatever entity just made that commitment. So it's, it's an easy thing to commit to, and it's much harder to see the process and the program behind it. And I think that gets tied up into the technology growth and where they think the most advantageous approach might be for their particular country issue or in, in achieving those particular goals. But it absolutely is going to require both. I'm sort of torn on this one um, because up until now, market has been dri driving all of this and, and the surge has been going on significantly and it's been done in a bipartisan effort. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I also realize that there is need for regulations because mm -hmm. it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. But as soon as the SEC gets, becomes, and it's already happening, it becomes political. Mm -hmm. and. My fear, as soon as it becomes political, everything starts to grind to a halt. And that concerns me seriously, because there are efforts right now that are trying to make ESG the boogeyman. And um, that could be detrimental. I, I'm a bit of a pessimist, I think, when it comes to regulation versus not, but it, it seems like the companies that we work with, they, they span the spectrum of ones out there that want to be leaders and are leaders, ones that are, you know, hey, Christine, I'm, I'm not doing anything till the SEC comes and tells me I have to. What really kind of freaks me out a little bit is, you know, especially as it relates to climate, that whole understanding of climate risk, the scenario, the, the various different climate scenarios and what that looks, what those risks look like across those scenarios, whether you make any external disclosures on that or not, or not, is really valuable information for your business. And, and granted, 
you know, the people at the company today aren't going to be the people there 30 years from now that are going to have to deal with some of these issues. But having an understanding of how the business may need to change, um, what what risk mitigation efforts may need to, you know, get to kind of grease the wheels a little bit now. Um, that's all, I think, really important and something I would suspect investors kind of want to see happening right now because they're in it for long-term value creation. I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth. No, 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 <laughs> not at all. I mean, I think that's exactly what the where we're trying to go. I mean, I had a very interesting meeting a couple weeks ago where I was fortunate enough to be asked to speak to the roundtable group that represents oil and gas industry CFOs. And it was a fascinating discussion because they obviously are a hard to abate sector. They're an area where people are concerned about what is the future. And it does go back to exactly that, right? It's what is the long-term free cash flow generated by my current operations? Every single person, he and her sitting in that room, knows they have a finite resource that in the long run, but again, in the long run, all of us are dead, right? So we have that problem. But in the long run, their free cash flows will, de will be diminished over time, whether it's through capital market decisions, whether it's through policy implications. So all of them are attempting to figure out how do they transition their business. And, and one of the less talked about aspects of what the oil and gas industry has done is that they are one of the largest investors in renewable energy. Each one of those entities represented in that room have materially large renewables business, ranging from onshore wind, offshore wind, geothermal, solar, but they don't talk about it. And the reason is, from, from what I could gather, obviously none of them said this to me, but I feel like what the problem is, is they recognize the long run issue, but they feel as though if they start talking too much about renewables, then what that does is start making people question, well, you're only talking about your renewables business, does that mean you're really more concerned about really the value of your fossil fuel business? And does that, what implication does that have in the market on valuations for, for their equities and things of that nature? And, and so it's really a fine line and it's difficult, and this may be where policy is critical to come in to maybe try to help support that transition and that shift. Because again, if, if Mohammed bin Salman can come out and say that Saudi Arabia does not want to be in the oil business, I think that's a pretty telling indication of what the future in the long run of that entire operation really is going to be. But it's going to need help in trying to get there and getting people to be much more longer term focused than, than what we unfortunately have shown in the capital markets to date. And, uh, you know, the auto industry is shifting. Shifting. And, and they're not going to change course. They're not going back to gas engines. No. Well, no, and, and you think about the little things that can be done. And, 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 and this is the thing is that w we can't shift today to tomorrow and eliminate all the use of fossil fuel, right? But just think about the environmental benefit if every automobile was a hybrid, for example. And oh, by the way, the more electric your vehicle becomes, the better the performance of the vehicle is. So if there's a way just to make these you know, step approaches, you make significant change while getting people comfortable with the concept of what you're trying to get them to look at in the longer run. But again, it's, it's, it's a lot of education. Mm -hmm. Well, and I would just add on an additional element to that is, you know, we haven't, we haven't necessarily talked a lot about human capital. And what we're, what we're seeing at Deloitte, we do a, a millennial survey every year that surveys the millennials and now Gen Z is that there's this generation of people coming out of school and looking to intentionally align their, their own core values to that of the companies they work for. And that's, I think, a really underrated element of all of this is how, how we think about talent and, and mobilizing our workforce and meeting their needs as an employer. We, I mean, Deloitte, we're a human capital business that's where we're people that that perform services and it's evident every day in in recruiting and talent and and what this means to our people and and, and what it's done for our organization Deloitte has really ambitious world, a world climate commitment um, right now and a, a large piece of that was because our employee base it's important to them 
And, and I think that if you look at the data that we have seen, one of the reasons ESG investing and impact investing has grown so rapidly in the last few years is that the two fastest growing subsets of investors are female investors and millennial investors, both of which don't ascribe to the concept that you sacrifice performance to be a responsible investor. And that goes exactly to your point about they're really focused on how do I find investments that align with my values and my principles. Mm -hmm. and, and ultimately, I think the other thing you said, which I thought was interesting, is I think that everything is a human capital business, right? A manufacturing company, the, the skill and technology, and I have a friend of mine who owns a small business that makes machines that help to um, construct um, rugs and, and, and um, textiles and things of that nature. And when you talk to him, it is almost impossible to find engineers and people who can work who have that specific skill set. That is a hugely human capital issue, mm -hmm. and all of this affects that, and, and I think we, we tend to forget that at times. Yeah. We are almost out of time with this panel, but I want to make sure to allow uh, a question or two from the audience. Um, if we can get mics over, a couple of questions, and then this gentleman back here. Uh, maybe just stand up. Uh, yeah, Dan Romito. Go ahead. Yeah, I work for a tenure trend which is fun. I don't want to offend the accounting people in the room. <laughs> um, don't you think to some extent the incessant focus on quarterly performance is one of the major detractors, particularly in oil and gas, to adopt and talk about the rules? I sort of love what this is question, but I'm just going to talk about that. <laughs> I would say, as the capital market participant up here, um, yes, absolutely. I think that is one of the major issues. Um, but I think it also is tied to the way that we structure and compensate executive management. And, and that's the reality. You know, that, that's the problem is that, you know, we, we see things that are too, you're going to do what you're incentivized to do, right? So if you have longer run goals versus quarterly goals, right? Then, then that makes a big difference. But I think you're absolutely right. The, the, the stock market, the fixed income market, every capital market is too short-term focused, and that's why we've gotten to the place we are now. That's why X, or BP didn't pay $300 for a seal in the Gulf of Mexico, and that's a problem. One more question, and then we'll have to go to our next panel. Out of that river water, a question you're going to see that, that would be, uh, what's the balance between outside the issue providers that would do internally, and then have you seen the correlation in your own internal or external ESG ratings and monitoring? Yeah, we use a combination. So for, for the funds that I manage, we use third party uh, data. We use Sustainalytics, MSCI, ISS data. Um, and Bloomberg Barclays data to create for my funds an eligible universe that's reflective of, of our belief of ESG leadership. But then we also have our internal analysts are also required in addition to providing a fundamental view to provide a ESG view as well. So it's, I like to think of it as kind of like a double cut. So effectively when you look at my holdings, you're going to see ESG leaders as defined by third parties, but then also should really see nothing worse than a neutral ESG rating from an internal part, uh, from an internal analyst. If we get a laggard, like if our internal analyst for some reason believes this issuer is a laggard, but it's still in our eligible universe, what that requires me to then do is reach out to engage with the issuer to get the questions answered about what our analyst is maybe seeing or thinking. But it, it ultimately goes to the fact that this is all an opinion. Right? Ultimately, Sustainalytics is an opinion. Moody's is an opinion, right? S&P is an opinion. And we've gotten to a place where I think we have forgotten that in this particular space. ESG and impact management is just another form of asset management, right? You're utilizing different factors and weighting different factors, I would say for certain on a fixed income side, every good analyst has always done ESG evaluation. It just wasn't something that was separately called out. So we all have to remember that the way that we're looking at this is as an a I'm an active total return fixed income investor that just happens to be utilizing ESG and impact as a way to differentiate and focus the fund and, and thinking that that additional lens, especially in an asymmetric return asset class like fixed, actually is beneficial for utilizing that additional data. And, and we have to always remember everything that you see 
is an opinion, going to the question I think you may have asked, right, about how you could have such devi deviations in ratings or views. That's because you had two analysts, right? They took in different weightings. They had a fight with their spouse that morning. They were in a bad mood one day. They had a great night. The Bills won last night. Go Bills. So they were in a good mood, you know, this morning when they rated it. So all of that, it, it's just additional data that you have to be able to process as an investor and incorporate into the portfolio construction process. I do over time, and, and I think it's the same that you see with credit ratings, and I think it's because of one reason. The issuer simply has more time to spend with, say, a sustainalytics analyst than they're going to have to spend with me and, and our fundamental analyst, right? So there's some signaling, I think, there that, that provides value, which is no different than the credit rating side. So that's why it's valuable. But I think over time you see that kind of that merging together, just like you'll see in credit ratings where they don't deviate a whole heck of a lot. Um, but again, still subject to analyst interpretation around what, what's relevant or what's really more important to them at that point in time. Okay, uh, with that, let's give our distinguished panel a round of applause.